Citizen Talks is a podcast series brought to you by TRT World Citizen, featuring discussions with humanitarians and activists, artists, and changemakers, exploring the global humanitarian issues that shape our society and the world at large. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Citizen Talks. This is your host, Ming Kailu, and we are here today with Andile Mguni. She is a social entrepreneur working at the intersection of food systems and climate change from South Africa. Thank you so much, Andile, for joining us today. We really appreciate you being here. Thank you for having me. It's an honor. So uh, just to begin, for our listeners who aren't familiar with you, can you just tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Okay, I think you, you've covered the professional title, social entrepreneur working at the intersection of food systems and climate. And I've worked in the impact space my entire career. So when I left high school, I had this really big debate because in my final year of high school, my mom was like, you have to focus on school and school alone. And I was like, oh my goodness, right? And yeah. I was like hectically involved in, in community service and, and projects within like my interact club at school. And then through that, I really found my purpose and I really knew that I wanted to be Um, involved within different aspects of of social work Um, and then I think that year was very definitive to me finding my purpose and really linked me to my work Um, so I think from there I founded a a social enterprise called Raw South Africa and we provided public speaking training to children in primary schools in townships in South Africa and and then we like all our profits that we'd make from any like paid engagements we'd in the the communication space we reinvested into into our social impact and I think just working within those vulnerable communities is really what ignited this passion for for social work and really seeing an, a really good difference on the ground um, and there I really noticed the the injustices within food and food insecurity although you're coming into communities with this really grand idea to say I've been empowered by public speaking this is something I'm innately good at but it's also gotten me access to so many opportunities how do you ensure that other children within vulnerable contexts have that Um, but then the reality is I am hungry and you want me to focus on public speaking right? Right, right so those those basic human needs challenges were, were just like some injustices that i couldn't be a bystander at and i started working within food systems initially as like a food storyteller like highlighting that hey we're in an urban setting and there's food insecurity here too um, and then from there i think it was just a, a really wanting to exist more meaningfully in the space um, so i think i am just a full breed impact person <laughs> that loves doing the work on the ground but also um, coupling that with like impact work within the policy frameworks too. Okay, great. So I do want to get into the specifics of your work um, in a minute, but first things first actually, I'm a bit curious to get your opinion about something. Yes. I was actually uh, previously in the humanitarian sector and I'm very familiar with social, social entrepreneurship and this kind of thing. And, and, and as a social entrepreneur, you know, would your opinion be that exclusively humanitarian interventions are are really effective? Do you believe that there has to be a profit motive or an economic engine uh, behind a particular social intervention to make it sustainable in the long term? I, w- I would think so for sure, because even with my journey, I started off in the nonprofit sector. Right. Um, my, my startup was a, a, an NGO, and then you quickly realize that there is no way of sustaining that without being dependent on donor funding on grants and that that's not sustainable at all how do you continue your impact um, within those those communities and build that sustainability within the communities to ensure that they are able to to see the impact without that re- constant reliance on, on external funding so for me social entrepreneurship was that incredible nexus that says you could actually do this leverage who has the money to pay for what you do Right, yeah. and then leveraging that to then still have the impact. I'm not concerned about about profits for myself or or like individual progress. Right, it's more about the collective. And if you can use business as a lever for that, and you see it with this upsurge of like we want the private sector involved in private sector funding because that really is where the money is. Yeah. Right, and I do agree that there is a space for for NGOs and and grassroots humanitarian activity. Um, because 
I think there's, there's just that community link that you can't negate and we ought to support those initiatives, um, but they have a space in society. But I would still say that if there is an avenue to find and build a, a more dual impact, profit for social impact uh, model, then social entrepreneurship is the answer. I would agree with you, to be quite honest. Um, okay, so then let's talk specifically about food system reforms. Let's take sort of a, a sort of a bird's eye view for a minute. Um, you know, what are what are the issues, and what do we need to do to resolve them? Right. Let's let's maybe perhaps start like with a local perspective that you're familiar with. Some perhaps a, a specific place you worked in the past, a particular project that you've been involved in. And then let's maybe talk about it from a global kind of collective perspective, right? There's a problem with the food systems that we're all surviving off of right now. What are, what are we needing to do to, to solve these particular issues? Ooh, I yeah. mean, now you, I'm starting to get excited now. Yes, I love <laughs> uh, that. This is fully my domain. Um, I think maybe starting off on a local context, right, right? And, and some of my work that I've done, I think a lot of my work has been within the food waste space or supporting organizations within that space because I don't necessarily believe that the world doesn't have enough food to feed the current population that we have. Yeah. And often food insecurity is attributed to growing population numbers. Um, for me, I think the challenge really is distribution. Right. Okay. A lot of food ends up in the same spaces. And as a result, the people that have access to it don't consume all of it. Mm. And then it ends up going to waste, which then contributes to climate change and methane emissions and um, the works. But really like seeing how sometimes good food goes to waste because it wasn't distributed well. Right. Right. So seeing that it's like some communities that are working in, in South Africa wouldn't get like access to nutritious food. Um, and from that, for me, it was like, how, how is this actually possible, right? How is it possible? How come the food doesn't get here or not, not enough of it gets here? Um, so I think t tackling that on a more um, frontline uh, challenge for me was something I really wanted to do. Um, and, and worked with, with some organizations that are like doing some innovative stuff to mitigate food waste in the spaces that it, it prevails, um, but also finding innovative ways um, to empower organizations that can like mitigate surplus food, right? And ensure that it still ends up um, with people, but there are also lots of regulations around it, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that was, the, I think that one of the biggest challenges to say, okay, now we work with with food banking um, companies and, and banks within the South African context, um, but then how do you, like the regulations around giving people food that is, you know, like the expiry, like almost there, yeah. are also like kind of working against you. But also, how do you how do you create um, frameworks? And there's this uh, wonderful organization that I'd work with that had these dinners called Odd Plates, mm -hmm. um, and they would literally like have chefs from from like oh chefs in training from a, a culinary school, and they would prepare these like fine dining meals from surplus food just to change the narrative around it, right? Yeah. I think we've been conditioned so much socially to say if it looks a little bad or like, you right. know, funny shaped as a fruit, then you shouldn't have it. But the reality is it's still good nutritious food. Yeah. How do you still do that? So I think a lot of my work on like the community level has been kind of trying to change those narratives to mitigate food waste, um, but also really helping organizations build those um, levers to like soup kitchens. How can they um, transition to be maybe like surplus food stores mm. instead? And then you work with food banks and, and they bring in the food, but you ensure that communities or members don't take food for a month, right? Because then you're guaranteed that probably something would happen in terms of health that you know food poisoning which is right. also something that you don't want to see so how do you ensure people take maybe food for a week and that that's like the that final last stretch um, of the shelf life that the food is there so it's changing narratives sh shifting opinions of of food um, and then from there taking action to ensure that people um, take it up but it's also leading by example and I think that's been the most interesting for, one for me it's like how how do I actually live by what I say um, like co home compost myself, I transitioned my diet, you know, like after like doing some significant work in food systems because I just knew that I can't speak about something that I don't know. 
yeah. or, or that, that I just have in theory. This has to be a lived experience and that's how you connect with people. Do you feel like the convenience of modern society kind of makes it almost like not an insurmountable problem, but a very difficult kind of problem? Because people do have to change their lifestyles. They have to sort of adjust the way that they eat and the way that they plan their eating and this kind of thing. And that's absolutely something that people loathe to do for the most part, right? So, you know, how, how can you kind of uh, convince the average person to, to sort of shift their, their, their framework in terms of the food that they eat on a daily basis? I think it works differently within different contexts, right? And that's like the number one thing to always take into cognizance when working with, with different folks. But maybe on a like more outward social media front, make it trendy, mm. right? People love hopping on a trend. And as, as cliche as that sounds, right? It really works. It does right, work. Right. People want to, to seem like they're part of something meaningful. And if you can leverage that to see those those changes and differences but also sometimes people don't think that me making the change as an individual contributes to a systematic change and it does Mm. it really does because if one person of two billion you know that one person or two billion people just make that one decision it, it does contribute to a significant change um so i would definitely say that that would be one avenue, like using social media streams or, or like platforms and avenues to leverage that that transition, but also educating around it, right? People, like I, I don't believe that always it's always going to be that people would know better and not do better. Yeah. So educating around it, but then within a more local community context, right? It's it's I think sometimes there's. Like, how do you go back to your roots, right? And and saying, like, this is what we did. I know for the longest time my mom enjoyed gardening and I, I wanted nothing to, <laughs> nothing a part of it. And now it's, like, something I'm completely interested in. But, like, also just building connection with, with all the generations through that and learning um, from them and, and, like, seeing how, although I can have my, my academic knowledge on food systems, I also now have this this connection with the land and from right. the stories and i think for me that, that that's really the big transition points so finding those those human connections um to the realities that we know of and that people can act from that point yeah so you actually you kind of you touched on something that's you know been sort of present in my mind a lot um you know, especially because I have, uh, as I mentioned, I have uh, my father's in West Africa and, you know, um, and the case that you see quite often uh, and the question I ask myself quite often, it's, it's, it's how can we get more young people involved in food systems reform? Because, you know, even out there when you have people who are, are living, you know, their subsistence farming primarily, uh, you talk to the young people, none of them really, none of them want to be a farmer, right? I don't know any people definitely in the West that want to be farmers and even out there where they're already just farming to live, they don't want to really be farmers either. Um, You know, they want to make, they want to move to the city and they want to make money. So, you know, is it possible in your mind to have a a shift in our next generation in that specific regard? Like what would be, what needs to happen to make, to make that a reality? Or do we need to change, you know, the way that uh, even we interact with food production to make it more honestly sort of individually democratized or what are your thoughts on on getting the youth involved specifically in food production yeah i mean that's definitely a, a challenge and i worked with with one organization and we asked children within schools where they thought food came from oh that's always and that was yeah. <laughs> complete yeah. disaster like some and they had to draw to like reflect where they thought food came from some drew um like shelves yeah. shelves <laughs> And I'm like, <laughs> oh, that's, that's very sad. <laughs> it is sad, it's true, right? It's, it's true certain, and sad. Yeah. Um, and I think like that was just like, okay, we need to do more to educate on, on where it comes from, right? Yeah. And then you seeing how do you initially like with having children involved in shifting diets, you know how children 
struggle with like eating their yeah. vegetables and like the bulk of, of children that is um, and it was like this this idea of having them involved in the gardening process and building gardens within schools that they actually like fell in love with like oh I made the, I grew this right I tended to it and now I'm eating it yeah. um, and I think that that full circle and like initiating those processes from such a young age kind of took brought a, a little bit of a shift right and you have more children wanting to say, actually I want to be, you know, I want to be a farmer, and it's and it's okay in that space because they've interacted with it, right? So definitely, education would be one space, um, but you, you you do still find that it's not trendy, right? The yeah. idea is particularly maybe from a global south perspective or previously. Um, marginalized perspective you want to shift this idea of poverty um yeah. and and change what that looks like in your family and usually that looks like a suit and yeah. not boots on a farm yeah, right yeah. um so those associations but also really like the knowledge around it right for the longest time food systems are run by by legacy families who are able to to leverage and make money from it yeah. right um but you don't see that because it's not within your context right a lot of uh, people have their subsistence, subsistence farming within their their context and then that's just like okay i don't necessarily want to live hand to mouth right yeah. but changing the narratives and and showcasing the narratives of successful people um uh, making money from from commercial farming right Yeah. Or even empowering um, local farmers to to have um, commercial streams that are able to to make them viable in 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 a way that can make it um, an example for younger generations to be a part of it. But I think it's for me it's like that that really big focus on on educating around it and there's this like big resurgence on like social media farmers in South Africa. Is lots it? Of, yeah, okay, like that's cool. lot, lots of like, young young farmers and there'll be like a a farmers in Daba like for just young people um to take part in and then people see that and it's like trendy and I remember one girl like did would do TikTok challenges on her farm, right? And it's like <laughs> <laughs> like it's it's you you wouldn't anticipate that as something no. that really draws attention to it but people really like yeah, her and it's it. like oh like this is this is something that's cool right and it's it's unfortunate that what we resort to as young people are just cool things to be a part of yeah. um but also leveraging that and, and and saying that actually you can use what's what's happening in the realms of young people um to to have them be a part of of meaningful causes and really careers within food and agriculture. Yeah, the internet is a it's a wild place. I'm not going to I'll tell you. Lots it's of control there. <laughs> no. So, you I want getting to some of the organizations that you've worked with a bit. So, you were um you're named one of Africa's brightest young minds by the UN World Food Program. You served on the COP28 Food Systems Non-State Actors Directive Committee, right? So these are big global international civil society organizations, right? Um addressing these issues on a regular basis. What is their focus? Cuz sometimes there's you feel like there's a disconnect between these gigantic, you know, multinational organizations and what's happening on the ground. Um so what are the trends, the perspectives that you're finding there and do you feel like their solutions are realistic for people at the local level, people who are, you know, actually living the reality that they're just kind of talking about in these in these spaces, you know. Yeah, I think that that's a really good question. Um and I think what what got me into the spaces was really realizing the gap right between my grassroots work and the organizations that I work with on the ground and and this like mystic world of policy and the decisions yeah. that are made on our behalf that affect us but don't really have a say in um and I think for me it was also about representing the youth voice within those spaces because you have the youth voice you have the global south perspective but you also have the on the ground um perspective um so I think there definitely is still a big gap within um those more high level spaces to grassroots community um spaces and it's it's about trying to bridge them and having more people that are involved on the ground within those spaces but you find like there there was a like a big thing about we need farmers at the table at COP28 right and they brought farmers to the table but 
it, within those spaces, it's acronyms and jargon and things that they don't relate to. Yeah. And it almost undermines their intelligence or their expertise within those spaces because they don't have the knowledge to participate within those con within those conversations, which is sad. Um, but then it's, it's also such a missed opportunity to say, how do you actually have a multi-stakeholder conversation that drives a meaningful change at all levels of, of influence? Um, so for me, I think being a part particularly of the of the directive committee was representing this knowledge and, and constantly bringing people back because a lot of the people that work within those spaces are very well intentioned right they're in, interested in, in driving the work forward but I think most of them have kind of left that on the ground activity even though they might have started there so sometimes there's a disconnect to to where they started or like having been involved within high level spaces quite a lot and can be quite <laughs> diplomatic about it um so for me it was constantly drawing back like who are we doing this for right and remembering them within those conversation conversations that we would have um but the conversations that are taking place they are really like driving policy um, obviously, there's a, a great sustainability lens when it comes to, to food systems that you need to think about. The climate is hectically affecting um, food systems, and food systems also contribute a great deal to climate change, right? So there needs to be food system reform um, that needs to take place, and it's, it's constantly about... Um, seeing how you can have policies and frameworks that lead to those to those changes and kind of chipping away at those systems that don't work at the moment and moving in the right direction. But I think also what I'm like completely interested in uh, when I like have my voice within those spaces is saying, how do we build systems that are, are sustainable and can be rebuilt, right? Not so, like what the biggest struggle that we're having at the moment is that a lot of this, the, the systems that we have in place are so hard to dismantle. And mm. I think that works against us because we spend so much try time trying to dismantle them so that we can have like sustainable food systems yeah. um, and and sometimes it's it's easier than like we we make it out to be but it's also building um, systems that really work right and can be changed so that future generations don't have to work as hard I'd say to to navigate the systems that they will be inheriting okay very cool um, unfortunately our time is short so I have to draw us down now <laughs> Oh, but really? uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> but I've been getting this for all, yeah, all day. I have uh, I have many more actually questions I would like to ask you, but perhaps we'll save those for another time. Um, before we do conclude, um, first things first, how can our audience connect with you? Where can they find you? Get you know involved perhaps in some of the things that you're working on, some of these issues. Um, and then I would ask if you have any sort of final words, conclusions, statements, anything like that that you want to uh, leave our, our, our listeners with. Thank you. Thank you for, for having me and really great to, to share space with you. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn at Andy Lemguni, A-N-D-I-L-E-M-N-G-U-N-I, -N -N and on Instagram at Andy the Future, which would be A-N-D-Y the Future. Um, and I like really share a lot of my work there, but also like some like action points or like sometimes organizations that I work with who have call to actions or ways that young people and all people in society can take part in. So there's always interesting stuff t um, to take part in there. Um, and I think what I would say as my parting words is really, you can make the change, right? You can be the driver of, of a better world, but you have to make the decision and have to want to, and it will be absolutely worth it. It's up to you guys. It's up to you. Wonderful. I, those are great last words. Thank you so much for joining us here today. We really appreciate you uh, being here and uh, sharing your, it was very enlightening for me. Seriously, I, I appreciate the uh, information you provided. And for our listeners, thank you guys for joining us, and we will see you on the next episode of Citizen Talks.